Welcome once again to Lato's Law. Here's Steve Lato. Buckle up. We've got a long one here, but it's a good one. Uh, and this is a win for landowners in Tennessee privacy debate. TWRA to appeal. And the Institute for Justice is involved in this case. I've had people sending me notes about this case for quite some time now. And uh, it's a crazy case. I was hoping it would play out a little further. But it's gotten to the point now where I think I can cover it. There probably will be an update further down the road. But Chris O'Brien and Caitlin Huff wrote this for WKRN. If you found cameras on your property, odds are you'd be a little surprised. Unless, of course, you put the cameras there yourself. So, for instance, if you've got a piece of property and you think people are coming on it, you can put a trail cam back there and see if that catches anybody on your property. But if you're walking around your own property and you spot a trail cam that you didn't put there, that raises some questions. Well, Hunter Hollingsworth, which is a great name, by the way, for this story, who's a resident of Camden, said it was right here pointing at a tree on his property. Out of those two little scrub oaks, it was on the one on the right, kind of right where that hole is right in there, 10 feet up or so. So this man's on his own property, and he spotted a camera on a tree that he didn't put there. So he's lived in Camden his entire life. And in case you're curious, population under 4,000. Hunting and fishing aren't just hobbies there. For many, it's a religion. Uh, When asked how long he'd been hunting, he said, since I was in pull-ups. In a story first, extensively reported by Field and Stream magazine, and then other news organizations picked it up from there, Hollingsworth was driving around on his hunting property one morning back in 2018 when he noticed something odd in one of his trees. As we came around the curve, my headlights caught something shining in the tree. I thought it was a raccoon or a possum or some animal, so I grabbed a flashlight out of my truck and shined the tree to see what it was, and I saw it was a camera with an antenna. So there are trail cameras you can get that simply have a card in them, a memory card. And every time it takes a photograph, it puts it on the card. And you got to go out and retrieve the card, take the card back and, and watch it. Or you can also watch it on the device itself. But, and then there's some that have little broadcast antennas on them. And they'll actually send the signal someplace, often using the cell phone network, so that someone else who's not on your property can sit there and look at photographs from your property that are being sent via cell. So that's what he was thinking here, is that there's a camera with an antenna on it. He took the camera down and found pictures of Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service agents on them, as well as himself. So the TWRA is a Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency, but also U.S. Fish and Wildlife agents were out there. So he put the camera in his gun safe and forgot about it until that fall, which is when law enforcement came knocking with a search warrant saying that they suspected he had stolen a camera. They accused him of theft for stealing something they hid on his property without his permission, without telling him about it. So they came in, they had on bulletproof vests, first aid kits, they were packing extra magazines like they were a SWAT team to come and get this camera that I stole, and he put it in quotes, that was on my property illegally. They searched my whole house. They handcuffed him, but he didn't go to jail or even receive a citation that day. Months later, U.S. Fish and Wildlife charged him with several violations, including illegal baiting and theft of government property. So apparently, the camera was owned by the feds. Hollingsworth took a deal to drop most of the charges, which resulted in the suspension of his license for three years. So they charged him with some hunting violations, but also the theft of government property. In response... He filed a lawsuit challenging the constitutionality of the cameras. And it says cameras, plural. So apparently there's more than one. A federal court threw the lawsuit out. And so he had legal fees adding up. He thought he was running out of options. He says, you're playing against a loaded deck to start with. Your average person doesn't have the funds or the time to fight them because they'll just drag you out and run you out of money. And yes, the government can outspend you. That's one of the reasons most people will not fight these things or even civil asset forfeiture cases. Then, of course, the Institute for Justice came along. <laughs> it's a nonprofit public law firm who we love. As Hollingsworth came to find out, he wasn't the only one the TWRA was watching. Through word of mouth, Hollingsworth found that his neighbor, Terry Rainwaters, also found two unwanted cameras on his property. One was pointed at my shop here in my house, he said. His attorney at the Institute for Justice, Josh Windham, said at the time, Rainwaters had a tenant renting out a home on the property. 
The TWRA and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife charged Rainwater's son and some friends with illegal baiting after an incident in a TWRA-owned area back in October 2017. Two months later, Rainwater said officers entered his land by river and installed the cameras, and, and of course he did not know about it at the time. There's one guy in particular he puts in off the highway in Sandy River Bottom on a boat, floats down, gets out on foot, walks all over this private property that's gate-locked. So there is a gate to keep you from walking under the property, but there's a river flowing through it. So he says the guy gets in a boat, floats down there, pulls over to shore, and then gets out and walks around the property. Now, of course, I've mentioned before that it depends what state you're in and what kind of river it is, but there are times where you are allowed to go down a river that is crossing private property, and sometimes you can even step on the property adjacent to the river, depending on the situation, quite often to get around an obstacle in the river. But it doesn't give you permission to get up and walk around the property willy-nilly, as I like to say. So the TV station here asked the TWRA officers uh, if they were allowed to do that. The agency, the TWRA, says it does have a boating law enforcement team that can go from boats to land. That officer would be able to step out onto that easement, that's public property, the uh, TWRA said, but it typically does stop at some point. They would not be able to go past that into the private property. So the question is, how far in from the river's bank can you go? And it's probably not that far. TV station followed up with a question on if the officer was on that team, the officer is involved in the other case, and they said, I'm not going to speak to him directly to that topic. Rainwater said he's never been charged with a wildlife violation in his life. But as it turns out, at the time, the TWRA and U.S. Fish and Wildlife were technically allowed to install these cameras because of something called the Open Fields Doctrine. The Fourth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution says the right of the people to be secure in the persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. There have been a series of Supreme Court cases addressing what your property entails that you're protected from because it actually says persons, houses, papers, and effects. Does that address a big piece of property that you own if you live in the center of it? So the doctrine clarifies in a 1924 Supreme Court case that those protections are not extended to the open fields. So again, think of it this way. You've got, I don't know, 40 acres, right? And dead center in that, you have a house, And you've got no trespassing signs all the way around it. The question is, do they need a warrant to set foot on your property crossing that border? I personally think they would, but the Supreme Court says no. Supreme Court says they only need a warrant if they actually intrude much more closely than that. And it will not address the open fields that are pretty much visible to naked eye. But my problem is the distinction between being able to see it and being able to go onto it. I don't have a problem with somebody standing on the road looking at a piece of property, seeing what they can see with their naked eyes. But when they come onto the property, among other things, they're trespassing. And so I would think that you ought to have a warrant if you're going to be trespassing, but the Supreme Court, again, disagrees with me on that one, and they win that argument. So the spokesperson for the TWRA says, our law enforcement officers, they follow the letter of the law, so they're doing what they were allowed to do. However, the Open Fields Doctrine dictates federal law. And this is important because the Open Fields Doctrine coming from the U.S. Supreme Court has said that you do not have Fourth Amendment protection against those kinds of searches in the open fields of your property. However, many states who have addressed this have come back and said, well, the U.S. Constitution might not protect you, but our Constitution does. Because a state constitution can give you rights that are not in the federal constitution. And these certainly don't conflict. So for the state to say, you've got more protection from us than you get from the feds, makes sense. So Tennessee constitution has a different word in a very similar section. They list persons, houses, papers, and possessions instead of effects. You can possess your land, and people do that all across Tennessee every day. So Rainwaters and Hollingsworth filed their lawsuit against the TWRA and asked the court 
to rule in their favor and award them one dollar in damages. And when you ask for a dollar in damages, you're doing it because you're pointing something out on a matter of principle. And they're simply saying, we want a ruling in our favor, give us a dollar, but rule that those agents weren't allowed to come on our land despite the open fields doctrine because the Tennessee state constitution protects us. So for the pair, it wasn't about the money. It's not about the dollar. It's about the rights that have been restored to property owners across Tennessee. The Benton County Circuit Court ruled in the pair's favor in what many see as a win for landowners. Of course, the TWRA now complains their job is getting a lot harder. Uh, we do now require a search license to be able to go on private property. It can be difficult, for example, to be able to get a search warrant a lot of times if we're dealing with a poaching or a trespassing issue at night. Well, you know, a lot of crimes occur without much notice, and they also occur at night. And uh, for some odd reason, law enforcement has no trouble getting warrants when they need them. And uh, of course, there are situations where search warrants aren't needed, but I'm not going to get heavily into that right now. But their complaint that this is going to harm law enforcement is, as you know, the knee-jerk response they always have when their job just got a little harder. The importance of the fact that the TWRA now has to obtain a search warrant before entering private property cannot be understated. They argue that wildlife crime will go up. Our issues are often very time sensitive. So if someone is hunting game illegally, they're going to be gone by the time we obtain a search warrant. So there's really nothing we can do about it at the point. It's a complex issue, as the TV station points out. At some level, people want the agency to be able to stop poaching and other wildlife crimes. But... You know, the question then is, do they need to stop it by placing uh, trail cameras on people's property without telling them about it? And go back to that story. Go back to the story of simply the trail cameras, okay? So they come on this guy's property, put a couple cameras. The other guy's property, they go on and put a couple cameras. Presumably, they're watching for a while, gathering evidence. Why couldn't they have gotten a warrant for those? Did they have probable cause to put the cameras there in the first place? Let's assume, let's assume they did. Okay? So they've got probable cause to place cameras. But they've got to place the cameras because these crimes are fleeting and happen at night. Um, they just put the cameras there and the cameras just sit there passively photographing everything that stumbles by. They could have gotten warrants. You know? And so this is one of the things that bugs me is when people are asked a question and they go from their own factual setting and jump off into a hypothetical. And I use hypotheticals all the time to explain the law and so on. But if the TWRA attorney was in front of me and I'm a judge and they say, your honor, these crimes are often fleeting. They happen at night. If we have to get warrants every single time we do this, we can't do our jobs. I'd say, okay, let's back up. Why did you place cameras on these two properties. Why? Was there probable cause to do so? They're going to say, of course there was. Say, okay. What was so fleeting and nocturnal that you had to place those up warrants? It doesn't appear that you were placing them in response to anything that's happening at that exact moment. You were hoping to catch something in the future and you weren't sure when it was going to happen. So you put up a trail camera that triggers every time something stumbles in front of its lens. You could have gotten warrants, couldn't you have? And you, you put the attorney in a position where they've either got to defend an absurd position or admit you're right. Because they could have gotten warrants. So we can talk about hypotheticals all day long. And, and sometimes we do. <laughs> you should see a law school class. <laughs> but, but here we have actual facts. Piece of property, fenced and gated, and marked no trespassing. And a government agent goes onto the property, surreptitiously places a camera, and leaves. Why couldn't they have gotten a warrant? What was so time-pressing about that that they couldn't get a warrant? And, well, Your Honor, these crimes are often... No, 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 stop. <laughs> Let's talk about the facts of this case first. We can talk about policy issues later, you know, hypothetical issues later. We can do all that later. Right now, let's talk about the facts of this case. And there was no pressing need to, to do this without a warrant. Get a warrant. 
And so I salute the courts in Tennessee, but of course, the TWRA is appealing this. They are appealing this. But just so you know, there are many states that have, when they've been addressed, when they've been asked to address this question, have said, you know, the Fourth Amendment might not give you that protection, but our Constitution does. Go get a warrant. So that's the story. But I have to tell you, and I had this sitting on my desk and a note to myself to, to mention this next time I mention the Institute for Justice. I talk about the Institute for Justice. I think they do great work. I've told people that if you want a good organization to support, it's these people. They're doing the work that other attorneys won't or can't do because it costs a lot of money and often the people who need the help can't afford it. But these are big issues. And so by helping these landowners in Tennessee, it's helping all of the people of Tennessee and actually people everywhere because this is another state that appears to be flipping on that open fields doctrine question. So I got a letter the other day in the mail, an analog letter, as I like to say, addressed to me, Mr. Leto. By the way, thank you very much, but you can call me Steve. <laughs> because of your and the Institute for Justice's call for the end of and the defense of those who have been or currently are victims of civil asset forfeiture, I wrote and sent a copy of the enclosed letter to my congressman here in Texas. So this man wrote a letter to his congressman and explains all these things that are wrong with civil asset forfeiture and a couple other issues and says, I want you to address these. And I am a registered voter constituent and, and you know, resident of the state of Texas. Therefore, I think you should look into this. He then said, I may not receive a reply or I may receive a form letter telling me how much he appreciates my concern and how hard he's working for his constituents. But I did reach out and exercise my First Amendment right to address the government with my grievances. Thank you for convincing me to get off my duff and do something. With the hope of ending these two travesties, referring to uh, civil asset forfeiture and qualified immunity, travesties that allow law enforcement to further their goal of destroying the guarantees that are enshrined within the Bill of Rights. I am also a monthly contributor to the Institute for Justice, namely for the fact that they work for the little man in his or her fight against government overreach, and it is well-documented disdain for our constitutional rights, and uh, that's what they're fighting. They're fighting people who are, who are apparently you know, disdainful of our constitutional rights, and the Institute for Justice is doing that. So he says, Steve, I look forward to your daily videos, and he signs it. And so I mentioned before, people often say, Steve, you talk a lot. You're talking about these things. What are you doing about it? Well, one of the things I'm doing about it is I'm talking about it because talking about it brings it to the attention of people. And I'm trying to get people to know this is a problem. What you do with the information could go in a couple of different directions. You could write a letter to your politicians. You could speak to them at a town hall. You could complain about it to anybody who will listen. And you can support an organization like the Institute for Justice who does great work. So I'm going to put a link to them in the description below this video and suggest that if you are so inclined to send them a couple bucks, you can make it a one-time thing, you can subscribe, whatever you want to do. And by the way, I get nothing from this. I'm doing this simply because I'm convinced they're doing good work. And they're doing good work that other people won't or can't do. Okay? So the Institute for Justice is a great organization. I highly recommend you check them out. They are helping these guys... And here's the thing, this case is up on appeal right now. And so the Institute for Justice will be handling that appeal also, and we'll see what happens there. So as of right now, though, it's, it's taken a good turn. Heidi sent me this from WKRN. Chris O'Brien and Caitlin Huff both wrote it. Win for landowners in Tennessee privacy debate, TWRA, is going to appeal. Questions or comments, put them below. Let's talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching Lato's Law. There are far, far better things ahead than any we leave behind.